Kelly. Gee. What's happening today? Gobble, gobble. Are you <laughs> thankful? I am super, super thankful. Like, what are really, you thankful for? I mean, so, so many things. I mean, come on. How many things could I not? I, I mean, I my list is one million things. So well, hard we're going to gonna spend one. our whole episode talking about what you're thankful for. JK, yes. everybody just left and unsubscribed from this podcast. But Ugh. we are going to talk about feelings. Oh, that's what I'm grateful for. I, I get now. I'm grateful for feelings. I'm grateful for branding. I'm grateful for natural talents. Excellent. And, Excellent. you know, I, when I think of feelings, I think of... I don't know where I'm going with this. I was going to say, I think of anthropology. Oh, you makes, do? Really? It's something unique to humans. But I don't, I don't know if that's true. Do, they, do we know? Do we, where are we with animals having feelings? I don't know. I like to think that my dog has feelings. Um, let's talk about your dog's feelings. <laughs> my dog is the neediest dog in the world. No, let's not talk about my dog and his feelings. I want to talk about talents. Talents. I want to know if you have any secret talents. Secret talents. Uh, gosh, unfortunately, no. I'm the least talented person. I always had to really like do the extra work, stay after it, practice. Zero talent. But you know what your talent is then? Hard uh, work. Practicing. Grit. 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 Yeah. Grit sounds like such a gritty talent. Yeah. You know, I, I never had the um, any hidden natural talents either. But you know what I think of? It makes me think that I think we do all have one amazing talent. It just might be that we never discover it because... I could be incredibly talented at, uh, oh gosh. I can think um, of two of your talents right off the oh, top of my head. Really? British accent. <gasps> goat Thank sounds. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Yes. British goat. Absolutely. Can we get a British goat? We haven't had one of those my in a while. My British goat would sound something like, bah! it's a little bit more refined. Which brings us to the topic of today's episode, bringing your British goat to work with you. JK, bringing your human with you. Yes, yes. You introduced this guest to me and we know that I love all things branding and content and uh, I tend to be the buzzword person on this episode and so I was just tickled when you introduced her as as a possible guest and I knew we would get to talk about these things. Strap in folks, let's talk about personal B word. <laughs> that sounds so gross. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your personal B word with you. <laughs> to work day. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing with your hosts, Key Sakalakis and Kelly Street, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsor, Nexa, formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800 267 9371 or online at www.nexa.com. All right, here we are with Caddy Gostasby. I am so excited. We are talking branding today, and it is one of my all-time favorite topics. Mine too. Awesome. Uh, so, Caddy, why don't you introduce yourself to our Lunch Hour Legal Marketing listeners and tell them a little bit about yourself if they're not familiar? Sure. So, um, my name is Caddy Gostasby, and I'm an immigrant. 
And version 1.0, my name is Katie. Katy Perry ruined it for me, but it, my mother likes me to pronounce it Katie the way she meant for it to be. So I immigrated to the U.S. in 1979 uh, from Iran originally. People always like to know where I'm from, so there you go. We thought we were leaving the country for two weeks, so we packed two suitcases, and we ended up um, never going back. So I grew, got to grow up in the Midwest in Indiana, and it was one of the best upbringings I've ever had. And I tell you this because growing up, I always wanted to save the world. And I thought I was going to save the world by becoming a securities lawyer. And this is where everyone laughs because we all know securities lawyers don't save the world. But perhaps Which is our topic way. for today, securities <laughs> law. <laughs> securities lawyers saving the world. We fooled yes. you all by pulling you in on branding. <laughs> We're going to talk about saving the world with securities law. Yeah, there you go. So, and I got to do that. I had a fantastic career as a securities lawyer. I Yeah, I put it out there and I manifested exactly what I said I was going to do. So I was a federal lobbyist in Washington, D.C. I got to see how that ugly sausage is made. The swamp. (laughs) That's right. I get lots of requests to run the branding campaigns for um, political... um, aspiring political wannabes. And I always say, no, I have found one person that I would do that for to date. But um, I did that. And then I went to the Securities and Exchange Commission. I was there when Enron blew up. So I got to draft a lot of the good rules that put a lot of people in jail. And um, slowly, though, you guys, I was becoming jaded with... um, What? Yeah, right. I was becoming completely jaded with the legal profession, you know, financial services. Um, I knew Bernie Madoff, for instance, and my husband always says, please don't tell people you knew Bernie Madoff. But <laughs> that's why I say it, because we were a very small group of regulators and regulated, and we had a lot of respect for him. So, you know, it left me jaded. And so I kept doing what I was doing and we put Band-Aids over everything. And then I went from the SEC to a major law firm. And in their DC office, and I switched hats, and my clientele were Frank and Templeton, Fidelity, all the big boys. It was always me and a bunch of men twice my age. And it was along this path that I noticed that I was giving a lot of advice, branding advice now, I noticed, but it was just advice to people on how should my career go? What should I be doing? How did you get that client? How did you get promoted? How did you go from this job to that job? And I would take people to lunch and say, look, I got an hour. I got to get back to work. Here's what I'm doing. Try it on. If it works for you, great. If not, um, we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll go to lunch again. Uh, and so that's how my second career was really born because there's a lot of lawyers in DC and it was a thriving practice, but, um, I didn't realize there was this missing piece in what I was saying that people really didn't fundamentally own and understand naturally for themselves, which I did. So from the law firm, I moved to California. Um, I went to Newport beach because my father was getting ill and I decided I'd move closer to my family who'd moved out here um, a long time ago from Indiana. And I was in house, I was investment counsel at Pacific life. And I reported to two um, boards of directors of mutual funds and I had a great career. So I had literally gone around the entire legal industry at this time, federal government, state government, law firm, in-house, you know, the whole bit. And um, it was in-house, it was on a Wednesday, as my story goes, and I had spent about 15 hours drafting a little itty bitty bit of a mutual fund prospectus, and that's all you need to know about that. And I went home nine o'clock at night, picture it, and I opened my own mailbox, and there just so happens to be my own prospectus, and what do I do? I reflexively throw it away because no one reads that stuff. And that was my big aha moment, you guys, standing there in the dark, that, oh my gosh, what if my entire quest to go to law school and make a difference? wasn't happening. I wasn't serving my purpose in the world. And so I quit my job cold turkey. And it was a very personal decision. And I'm not advocating other lawyers do this. In fact, I advocate that they don't, that they figure out their purpose within their practice and live their better life for it. And so um, two years before the recession, when I quit my career, no one was reinventing themselves. No one had to because corporate America was humming right along. But I did. I thought I was crazy. Everyone else thought I was crazy, but I couldn't see a way out. And uh, took a random community college course taught by an ex-Harvard litigator of all people on natural talent. And he really made me see that I have a natural talent. We all do. If we do it, we're going to live longer and be happier. But for my purposes, he said, if you practice your natural talent along with whatever you're doing, it's a no fail. People can tell you're good at it and they gravitate towards that. They want a piece of it and it's exciting for them. And your business 
can only grow. And so I said, I don't have one of those natural talents. I'm just a lawyer. And they spent 20 minutes on me because I was so pathetic. You guys, I was so pathetic. I was so left brain trapped in my left linear brain. And here we are all these years later, he called me up to the front of the room. Curtis was his name, the ex Harvard litigator. And he said, please do this for your fellow lawyers. And I said, do what? I was flummoxed. I was exasperated. I was angry. And he said, you'll figure it out. And here we are 12 years later and the business has grown and iterated. And um, I love what I do. So there's my very long answer to your very short question. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What a journey. It has been and it is. And that's the best part of life, right? The journey. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, uh, Guy and Kati, you two met at Clio. And here's my first introduction to the two of you. So Guy, why don't you, I would love it if you would talk about the Clio session and and how kind of the things that stood out to you and then have Kati talk about, uh, you know, expand on it a little bit more because I'm just really excited and sad that I missed it. Well, actually, Guy and I know each other from the ABA Law Practice Division. So before right. Clio, but yes, you're right. Face to face, first interviewing session. That's right. But I, you know, I was so impressed with the presentation. Uh, I was assigned for uh, on the road to interview you, so I was pointed in the right direction to come and uh, attend and make sure that I was fully engaged. Not that I'm not fully engaged in other sessions, <laughs> but I was so impressed. And I and I, as I often do in my personal life as well as on this podcast, I always come in with a bit of sometimes unhealthy skepticism, but I think in this case it was healthy. And it's not, uh, it's more of an indictment on the people that try to make branding do too much, I guess is the best way I can say it. But you all, I mean, honestly, you could have given that presentation without even using the word branding. Um, It was about human interaction and emotion and and I don't want to get, I want to let you, uh, you know, deliver your own thunder and lightning, but <laughs> it really struck me uh, how much of this is absent in so many professional contexts. And, mm-hmm. you know, what I'd like to be able to do, at least in the short time that we have, is for those that are coming to this with some skepticism about the word branding. Uh, I, I would all, I'd love to challenge us to try not to use the word branding. I know Kelly's going to be like, no way. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think focusing on that, helping folks understand that it's not the hundreds of years that you've practiced, uh, your subject matter expertise always, and your where you went to law school and how hard you fight, because that's what we see lawyers trying to project in the world. And... And I'm going to stop right there and let Caddy take over. So thank you. Thanks for those kind words. Thanks for coming to my um, session. Yeah, there was about 500, 600 people there. It was packed and everybody was fully engaged and asking good questions. So I consider that a success. And thank you for your insight. I love skeptics. I love skepticism because it's just contrast, as I say. It's just people bringing their views and let's talk about it. And um, I can talk about it with 500 of my closest friends from the stage as a professional public speaker. And I love the opportunity because um, it isn't, the word branding is overused. You know, 12 years ago when I feel like Al Gore, you know, when we first started using Mm -hmm. personal branding, finding the internet, right? Uh, it It was a term that was really a term of art. And it was about the fact that I looked out, I have a very natural talent of being able to project out five years from now and being able to see what's missing and what people need and what businesses need and what law firms need. And I saw that people were gonna have to start relying on themselves. Lawyers were gonna have to start counting on their own professional credibility rather than the law firm name or the brand of the business. And the people had to start owning their stuff. And um, that's really what the business is about. You know, when I speak, you can take the word branding straight out of there. Gee, very insightful of you to say, and I'm sorry, Kelly, you can keep using that word, but it really is about <laughs> how are people able to unearth who they are naturally, the essence of who they are, find their truth in life, and be able to communicate that effectively to an audience. 
in order to build power and influence, in order to gain favor, in order to get their agenda met, in order to drive results, in order to drive business to their door, to have a happier relationship and a better marriage, uh, to communicate better, all of that, just because we're human and we can't leave our human at home and we must bring the human to work and we can't bifurcate who we are. And oh, by the way, all this has to do with doing it authentically. Otherwise, you're just somebody else trying to peddle their wares out there. And I want better for us lawyers because we're good human beings. I had clients all morning before this interview, and one of them was an employment lawyer, and he represents the employees um, because he really, we developed a story. He truly understands, you know, he stands for the common person and the little man not being, pardon my language, um, can I say screwed on the air? Anyway, yeah. so. I think so. I think so. <laughs> um, we'll tag this as explicit. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, you know, and I told them, I said, you're an educator. You must sit in front of this clients and educate them. Every employee must know that we don't just randomly sue our employer. And this is not okay. And you must have merit and meaning behind what you're standing behind. So I tell all my clients, all my lawyer clients to go out there and educate and be part of the system that's better rather than adding to the problems we have in society and corporate America. And so that's what the session is about, really getting people to own their strengths and understand who they are. And then I bring my research into it around stress and self-confidence. And um, we can talk about that whenever you're ready to talk about that. You know, I, I normally am the light and fluffy one and usually I'm like, oh, branding and whatever. Um, that makes me the heavy and, one. In content, um, <laughs> light, I mean, light and fluffy or I know dark and crusty no, I'm just crusty. <laughs> so, no you got me you, yes uh, how do no. you know me all know me so well uh, no um anyway uh so i'm i normally tend to be that that on this show but i have to say i um i can see how lawyers would have a challenge with the idea of branding and how light this does seem so how do you how would you communicate the importance of having a brand and also um, identifying, saying, hey, well, I can pick this out from your law firm or the way you practice. And so this is how you can think about, quote, brand without calling it branding. Yeah. So good question. None of this, nothing in life has to be so freaking heavy, right? Everyone thinks yes. like, like one of my other clients this morning, I'm just drawing on all my clients this morning, was like, I can't figure out this purpose of mine in life. And, you know, it's been years we've been working on this. I'm like, it doesn't have to be so heavy. You know, I'm serving my purpose. Maybe your purpose is just to show up happy every day and that's good enough for the world. You know, nothing has to be so darn heavy, but we're left linear brain people and we're analytical and we just kill everything with the thought. So branding, you know, personal brand, the definition is very easy. It's unearthing your unique and relevant attributes. What's most unique and relevant to you? Okay. That's really relevant though. We don't just grasp at straws because I'm very intentional about the plan we develop for our lawyers. So what's unique and relevant about you? That requires you having clarity and understanding who you are. So Kelly, I think you said, by having a brand. Everyone has a brand. You just have to discover it and unearth it. And that's your truth, really, right? So lawyers are like, oh, this is getting too mushy for me. It's really not. It's just the way human nature works and we think and we process data. But it's so much easier to rest in our left linear brain and just keep thinking about substantive work, you know, securities law, A plus B equals C. That doesn't really drive the agenda of making us be able to drive business to the door and make more money. It doesn't. You have to be able to do the substantive law, but you have to get all this stuff down because it serves as the foundation for you being able to make money off of your substantive knowledge. End of story. So the first part of the definition is who are you and do you have clarity around who you are, your natural attributes, your strengths, the relevant ones. And then the second part is let's get rid of those subconscious blocks that keep you from being able to take those attributes and get people's attention with them, okay? And everyone has subconscious blocks. And I always say this from the stage, mine is that I'm an immigrant and then I must not be good enough, okay? Now, is that real? Is that true? Of course not. Look at me. I'm running a thriving business. Everything's good. Uh, of course I'm good enough. But the subconscious block comes from our stories, right? From you know our daddy issues, as people say. I mean, I am not a therapist, but 
100% of everyone tells me the work we do is therapeutic because it has to be because we're utilizing, we're tapping into who people are in order to get the results they want and have them make more money and be more successful. So um, what are those subconscious blocks? And so that's where it gets a little painful for people. I always tell all my clients, you are brave. You're, my clients are brave and courageous. They're practicing law and yet they're still showing up and being willing to look at themselves. So nothing is broken in my world. None of my clients are broken. They're all going from good to great or great to greater. That's really what fundamentally a fantastic brand is, something that we're always evolving. And as Guy said, I always call it version 1.0 because it's an iterative process. You can never get it wrong but you can never get it perfect. It's just growth, right? And growth comes through change, which is my expertise. And so we have to look at those subconscious blocks. And then the third part of the definition is now that you know who you are and you've unearthed it and you've gotten rid of those blocks that keep you from successfully doing it over and over again, because we don't recreate the wheel in my world, very pragmatic. We figure out the formula and then we put it out there to make money. And then the third part is how does your audience view them? Your audience could be your spouse. If you're trying to get a date, it could be that. It's it's anything in your life, but you have to get that audience feedback in order to use data points in order for us to be able to iterate again and keep growing. So if you're not one for iteration and growth and change, you're not going to like my process. But you're probably not also thriving right now as it is if you're not willing to at least engage more in growth and um, an iterative process and and change because dynamic brands change and dynamic brands are willing to grow. So that's how I define a brand. And I make it fun and light because it's supposed to be fun and light. Otherwise, it's just too heavy. And business is not meant to be so stressful. If you're not having fun in business, as I always say, uh, you're stagnating. And um, the stress is too high and people can't function under that stress. And I can't handle having one more lawyer commit suicide through the press mm. or through personal knowledge. It's just, it's just wrong. Frankly, no one should have to be going through that in life because of stress of business. Uh, it's just wrong. And so th- that's my personal mission as well. Way to keep it light. No. <laughs> uh, but I would, uh, one, one sub point you made that I'd like to kind of pull out here, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I think it's important because I, I do think uh, a lot of lawyers think like this, is you, you use the word bifurcation especially with, as it relates to branding, personal brand, firm brand. And so a little plug for the uh, 2019 ABA Legal Technology Survey Report. That's a lot of words. Woo-hoo. Uh, but um, the Marketing Communication Technology chapter, one of the things that they ask is, do you use Facebook professionally? And the answer is 31% use it professionally. Then they ask, do you use Facebook personally? use it personally. And so I was just having this conversation and it's like, uh, I think you're missing the point here, right? There, you can't, you are, when you're out there in the world as you with your personal B word, you are using it professionally. If you're using it to build relationships, right? Absolutely. You can't leave part of yourself at home. And so when we go into organizations and, you know, I work with more than law firms, um, you know, it's a whole employee process. You know, I think um, a major company, um, Uber, has just launched actually the whole person. Bring your whole employee to work. And that's what happens. When I go into um, firms and organizations, the number one thing employees tell me is I feel isolated. I feel alone. I'm like, you got a million people around you and you've got the internet. You know, you can tap into anybody at any time. And they're like, nope just feels very lonely. So people aren't able to actually um, figure out who they are because they feel isolated. And so when you tell them that they're bifurcated and bringing only parts of themselves to work, then they feel even more lonely because it's inauthentic and it's fake. So part of my process is to let them just be who they are and really bring their best selves to the practice of law and let them off the hook. So my formal research around stress and self-confidence, which I did 10 years ago at UCLA with a neuroscientist, shows that as our stress goes up, 
our self-confidence goes down. So there's this direct inverse correlation between stress and self-confidence. And everyone's stressors go up because it just happens, even for the most self-confident people. And so when your stress is going up because of traffic, of kids, of deadlines, of you know, of how do we how do we expand the practice, your self-confidence is dropping, it must proportionally drop. And that means your brand value diminishes, which really means you're not emotionally resonating with your audience. And there's only one emotion that sells anything as I teach it, and that's happiness. So at some level, do you as a lawyer make me happy? Okay, which is why I keep things light. And so when this does not happen, then people's stress is extremely high and they feel bifurcated even more as humans versus lawyers. And, and they fail in all sorts of ways because their self-confidence is low. So those numbers gear are astounding and they shouldn't be that way, frankly, because you just show up as you wherever you go and bring your best self. And Bring your human with you. Bring your human with you. Bring your best self with you. Yes. Love it. I think that should be the title of this episode. Bring your human with you to work. Yeah. As an an SEC lawyer. (laughs) How do you make people happy as an SEC lawyer? Well, you know, I I don't know if you remember my audience and it's a typical question. I I said, at some level, do you bring happiness? And um, I said, now look, I get all you divorce lawyers are going, I really don't deal in happiness. Right. And remember some woman stood up and said, I'm a divorce lawyer. And that was exactly my question. And everybody erupted out laughing. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, I get it. But so if Coke and Pepsi can sell thousands and thousands of Coke bottles an hour with the tagline, deliver happiness, open happiness, um, drink happiness. Starbucks does the same thing, right? And some cinnamon and nutmeg mixed with joy. Um, Their holiday cup is sitting right here in front of me. And I'm sure it's got some, we wish you a merry coffee, right? So uh, they get that the world revolves around the infusion of happiness. So even if you're a divorce lawyer or a securities lawyer, how do you bring joy into people's lives? At some level, are you elevating their moods? Because I got a lot of places I could spend my money and I need a lawyer, right? I'm the only point of reference I have because I'm going to assume every lawyer said or spare is substantively able is do you make me happier at some level? If I got to spend time and money on you, you better at least make me feel better than before or the next guy who's not going to elevate my mood. Right. So that's all I'm asking for. Yeah, no, it makes so much sense too. Because again, uh, you know, maybe there we can talk about the spectrum of legal services, consumers, uh, sophistication levels, but most of them, you're right. There's a pre- built-in presumption that you're competent to practice law. You're going to choose the person that makes you happy. Absolutely. And that's the only way we buy anything. I mean, you guys have all heard this by now. It's Marketing 101, but I don't think the law firm community has heard this enough, at least. Uh, people don't buy on logic. So they we buy to express our values. We buy based on emotional guttural response, which is what all the products industry relies on. And then we justify our purchase. You've heard this before through logic. It's the way the world works. So why do lawyers and law firms fight this and keep selling from logic, right? I'm a really good lawyer. I'm really good at what I do. I'm not going to sell because um, I was trained to be a proficient lawyer. Well, great. I have a finance degree and an econ degree and a law degree, but I sell off of happiness because I'm not trying to make this complicated for myself. I'm good at what I do and I know people need me. And so I'm going to tell you that I'm going to make it easy for you. You're going to feel better. You're going to make lots of money after working with me and I'm good at what I do. And I'm going to sell it from a place of elevating your mood when I do, because this should not be that complicated, but we make it so complicated for ourselves as lawyers. All right. That is a great place for us to take a little break and hear from our sponsors. And when we come back, I have a question about adaptability. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexa's virtual receptionists are available 24-7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm software, and much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. And we are back from break. Okay, we were talking about happiness, but I have a different question. 
that is about staying on course as I take us off course of happiness. And I'm wondering, you, Caddy, you mentioned earlier adaptability. And branding, I think, can be a little bit of a challenge when you think about being adaptable and you're like, okay, well, I've got my brand and I want to be true to my brand, but yet technology is changing my practice or I have a new associate coming in or a new partner coming in who we need to kind of rebrand to think about adding that other person in. So how do you be adaptable, but yet with your brand, but yet stay on kind of a, a path and, and moving forward? So excellent question, Kelly. So um, the phrase I've coined is adapt and adopt. And um, that's really why I was at Clio, because when Jack Newton and I talked, there's a there's a technology issue that that I hit upon. Um, you know, when new technology is brought into law firm life or any organization for that matter, it's a change, right? And so whether it's a merger and acquisition, people getting fired, hired, or new technology, people always say this technology doesn't work. And I say, why? And they say, because, you know, my employees and lawyers aren't using it. So it must stink. And I'm like, what if it was the lawyers? Because they weren't adaptable. They weren't willing to use the technology well. And so the technology companies are like, please, this isn't us. Our technology platforms work, but we just don't know how to say it to the law firms who's paying us a lot of money that, hey, Clio is beautiful. It works. You know, maybe your lawyers aren't really equipped well to deal with change and to adapt and adopt in a way that's efficient, effective, and everyone's happy. So the real goal is to have a brand that where you're willing to change. And really by brand, let's just forget that word. Sorry, Kelly. It's really a mindset shift, right? Around being someone who's nimble and who will pivot quickly and who doesn't have to cross those T's and dot those I's so hard. And look, I get it. I'm a lawyer too. Perfectionism is part of our nature because that's what makes us good as lawyers. But when we don't adapt, we can't adopt. And we look like um, we're not malleable and flexible and clients don't like that, right? Who likes that, right? And the worst part of that is we get left in the dust, right? If your people aren't going to adapt Clio, for instance, or any software or anything technology oriented, then what are you going to go back to using a typewriter? I mean, is that how it's going to work? I guess you can. It's just, it's not really, it's not a super sexy brand to sell and um, it's not efficient and effective anymore in this, in this era. So let's be pragmatic about it. So there's a balance though, about knowing who you are and your level of ability to change. And that's all I'm asking for. All of my my clients know this about me. I never push people outside of their comfort zone because I want them to do things at their own pace and just bump up against that comfort zone to see where they could iterate a little bit in order to find something fresh for themselves. And also that makes the practice of law more exciting, right? When we're willing to change and adapt and look at things differently, then the same old, same old becomes a little exciting and a little creative. And all of that at the end of the day is about healing finding a way to self-heal ourselves, which is um, what my next book is going to be about. All of this can be wrapped up very nicely with a bow called self-healing. How do you develop a brand as a lawyer, as a person, capturing all the stuff we talked about to provide yourself with tools to heal? You're in control of this bus. No one else controls you. He knows I talked about the five C's in my talks and in my trainings. The biggest C is control. And in order to stay in control of yourself, you have to be able to heal yourself and take care of yourself. And part of that is adaptability. Yeah, well said. I like that. I also you know, do I, I'm wondering about, you're talking about adaptability and what is your uh, quote again? Adapt, adapt and adopt. adopt. Yes. Um, so when I'm thinking about this B word, cause I'm, or, or strengths, we can nice, just call them Kelly. strengths. <laughs> We've converted you. I call it natural talents, but you can call it whatever you want. Yes. How about the human talents. beings? Um, when you're talking with a lawyer about their natural talents, how do you translate that from, you mentioned it a bit uh, in talking about, hey, you feel really passionately about helping the employees, so here's how you do this. But how do you take that identification of strength and natural talents to this is how you put this out in the world in your daily practice, or this is how you showcase in your logo or, or on your website, you know, that practical application of talents. 
Excellent, excellent question. So first of all, I don't do anything. I'm the conduit, really. And I'm not trying to be humble, although that's a great brand. But I truly mean it. You know, I empower my clients to do that because I I always say I'm not here to fish for you. I will not be here forever. I can't be here forever. I'm here to put the right tools in your toolbox so you are motivated with self-confidence to do it for yourself and go put it out there. So uh, natural talents are not what people think they are. In my world, natural talents are not, I'm a good litigator or I'm good at fact-finding. Natural talents are way broader and bigger. It's about the whole person like we were talking about. So, you know, for instance, let's take a client who has a real keen sense of empathy and compassion. And how do I know this? Because they write me their whole story. It's a very private story, but we parse through this story. And my natural talent is to pull out all their underutilized skills and assets and um, put a bow on them like you're asking me about. So say they're compassionate and have empathy and say they're a, oh, I don't know, let's pick a practice area. Let's stick with employment law. Um, How are we going to constantly bring that and package that into the message of who they are as a person? And then people can naturally draw the lines that, hey, you know, I'm empathetic. I, you know, when I was in fourth grade, I saw somebody get hit by a bus and I ran out and I helped them, something like that. I'm just making stuff up. I'm exaggerating, obviously, no one in fourth grade would go through that, hopefully. But um, it really made me, you know, you know, have a flex my muscle of empathy and I really have compassion for people's plights and the little man um, because I kind of grew up in that atmosphere. And so that's what makes me a good lawyer, right? And people are like, it does. Two plus two does not equal four in my world, right? We extrapolate everything we work on is subconscious processing of information in my world. So that's why I ask people to suspend their left linear brain judgment and observations that jump in their right creative brains with me, which is painful. By the way, if you're not uncomfortable with any of my work, then you're not growing. I say that to my audiences. You heard that when I spoke. Discomfort is where it's at. So having you go in your right creative brain and say, you want me to talk about empathy and compassion is my natural talent? I'm like, yeah. They're like, what does that have to do with the practice of law? I'm like, everything. You could pick any other natural talent too that would fit because it's not about the practice of law. It's about who you are and how you sell yourself to me and the consistent message then that we take from there, Kelly, like you asked, and we put it everywhere. We put it in their verbal message, on the website, the message. We imbue it in all of their communication. And by the way, the website and the logo, all that stuff comes last. I don't actually even design the websites and do the logos. I package it all up and the website companies and the the hardcore branding people really love me for that because it's very easy for them at that point to take that. But it's about then how people show up literally physically show up and start selling themselves, Kelly, because they start to own their natural talents. We run a program called Branding Boot Camp, which for seven months, once a month, for just two hours, people go through group training for this. And we just ended one on Friday, and that's why it's so fresh in my mind. And at the end, I go around and I ask people, what's one profound thing you learned? And one person said, you know, I learned that I have unique abilities and that my story matters and that I matter. And that in and of itself brings everyone's natural talent to light because whatever it is, it's laying dormant. And it's not only going to make you a better lawyer, it's just going to make you a better human. And so by extrapolation, it it comes out and people start owning it in all the medium that you talked about. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's a really um, more, a much more tangible way of, of putting it. Cause I think, um, you know, people, whether it's under the surface or, you know, right on the surface, people sometimes know what they're, what they're good at and, uh, sometimes need a little help digging it up, but it can be difficult to understand how your empathy can translate into your business. And sometimes I think lawyers can, worry that empathy is a good one, that it can be a hindrance on your practice, but you can bring it, you can find a way to bring that out while still protecting yourself and not getting too stressed out and all of the things you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have empathy and compassion for your audience, I call it tactical empathy. It's not my term. It's Chris Voss's term. Chris Voss wrote this great book called Never Split the Difference. He was an FBI interrogator. And I love the phrase tactical empathy that he uses because it's really about 
you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to necessarily share my views, but you have to understand my side in order for you to tactically understand where I'm going next and to be able to gauge my responses to the dialogue that we're having and to be able to know what to do next in order for you to get the results you want. So that's tactical empathy and everyone needs that. So that's just being able to sit in your prospective client's shoes. And when people don't sign up for that, don't want to do that, they're shooting themselves in the foot because it's an easy way of converting leads into clients and into getting people to love you and to promote you and to remember you, frankly. So, yep, that's a good example. Yeah, no, and it's uh, just to kind of bring that to some data, you know, that was one of the things that they talked about from the uh, Clear Legal Trends Report is that uh, a lot of legal services consumers, potential clients, human beings, they'll stop looking for a lawyer once they find the one that they like. And if that's the first one they find and they happen to like them, that's the end of their search because that's the most important thing for them. Absolutely. It's all about likability, like I talked about that day as well. And I always talk about, are you likable? Do you stand out enough for me to remember you? And are you likable? When I was on the Hill as a lobbyist, the number one rating we looked at for political candidates were their likability ratings. We didn't look at the platforms. We didn't look at anything like that. We're like, if their likability rating was high, they were doing well in the polls. If it was low, they weren't. It's pretty basic human nature. We just fight it as lawyers because it's uncomfortable, right? When I ask you how likable are you, ew, that should make you really uncomfortable. Um, Not because you've done something wrong, but because it's just like a tough question to want to look at. So people like bury their head in the sand and go, I'm just going to stick to this tough substantive stuff. I'm really good at tax law or I'm really good litigator. But, you know, I always bring up the example of um, one of the biggest and most successful litigators I know who brought billions of dollars into his firm. And now he's chair chair of the firm. It's a global firm. Um, before he was chair of the firm, he was chair of litigation. And he would go around every morning and he would ask his staff, are you happy? Are you happy today? And the lawyers would say, you know, it's really weird. He comes every day to our door and knocks on it and asks us if we're happy. And I'm like, you know, there's something he's onto that you're not getting. I'm telling you, the happiness quotient is extremely important to the practice of law to reducing your stress. But it's also important to converting and it also goes to the likability factor. If you're happy, then you're likable, right? So it's on a spectrum though. I don't want anybody to listen to this to think, oh my gosh, now I have to put on my clown nose and grab my pom-poms. No, it's got to be authentic and it's on a spectrum. And it's, it's, are you happier? Are you elevating my mood just a bit? You know, everything you can do around this is good enough. I don't want you to add more stress to your life um, trying to figure it out. Awesome. Well, we're winding down here. We're almost out of time. Kelly, any final thoughts or questions? Oh, I just, okay. I have one really quick question. I want to be respectful of your time to stop, but I am wondering when it comes to natural talents and using those in your law practice, how do you advise lawyers use those when, um, when kind of vetting clients? Yeah, I think what you're saying, if I'm understanding you, is um, the answer is that lawyers have to make sure that they're picking clients that are good clients, okay? So if I hold myself out as a lawyer that's aggressive and tough, I'm pretty sure if I'm saying those are my natural talents, that I'm going to attract clients like that who are aggressive and tough with me, with me as the lawyer, right? So it's a problem. It's a problem because I think we need to really, with authenticity, own who we are and our natural talents and not just put out there what we think people are going to want from us. You don't know which actually brings us to a great place to bring this home with is about being present and listening, okay? I watch so many lawyers who can't hold my eye contact, who can't hold my gaze. And a lot of what I teach to Guy's point is all communication, right? Effective nonverbal and verbal communication, which brings the package together as a brand, right? So if you're not listening, if you're not present, how are you going to really be able to figure out if that prospective client is a good one for you? It, at the end of the day, I get it's about money, but it can't only be about money because that's a bad leading indicator because you're going to get tough, difficult clients that you don't want. So the biggest gauge is using your own 
who you are and your own talents. And let's make it one step easier. I give everyone five adjectives in my programs. And I actually did this from the stage at Clio just because I want people to actually have a takeaway uh, without me even being able to coach them. But it's good enough for that moment. But part of that is what are your three values? If you don't know your values that lead to your personal adjectives, then you're going to have a hard time running anybody through your filter of natural talent. So I always say I have four values, freedom, fairness, faith, and fun. And if prospective clients don't go through that filter, then I don't work with them. And it also then helps me actually own my natural talents because my natural talents aren't necessarily my values, but they represent my values. So I hope that helped, Kelly. You know, I could talk about this for 10 hours. This is why I'm a trainer and a, and a researcher. Um, but I'm hoping I gave everyone at least a bit of content so that they have a good start and they have at least introspection and some tangible bits to sit and ponder for themselves. Yes, that was super helpful. I, the idea of a filter, I think, is something that can be hard to put in place because you worry about excluding people, but um, is so necessary for so many yeah, businesses. You can't be all things to all people. No, no. So I know you have a webinar coming up and we want to make sure people get directed to that. So um, can you share your webinar and where people can contact you? Sure, absolutely. So um, two things people are always asking me, what is your philosophy and what are these teachings of yours? And because they're very different, like Guy said, he kindly pointed out, I'm not your traditional marketing person at all. And the second question they asked me, what is this branding boot camp? So branding boot camp is a program, like I said, that we've been running for a decade for um, law firms and, and people from all walks of life that want to learn the material. So um, I do a one hour webinar, 45 minutes to an hour once a month. We're skipping December because it's the holidays, but January 10th, 2020 at 11 Pacific, it's free. And we, I give you all this content in a parsed out manner. It's a little more um, palpable for people because they can see the screenshots and follow along the presentation. And then I also explain what Branding Bootcamp is for those that are interested or just want to find out what it is. And then we offer the two of them at a discount. And then Branding Bootcamp starts January 24th. So that's coming up January 10th, the free webinar. If they want, they can go to our website, which is puristconsulting.com, P like Paul, U-R-I-S, like Sam, consulting.com. And there'll be lots of information on there, or they can contact you guys and they can put, you guys can put them in touch with me. It's just Katie at puristconsulting.com. And we can give them access to the free webinar and the free recording that comes with it afterwards on Zoom. And there's all sorts of free content also out there. And I, I'm happy to share my summary of research on stress and self-confidence with folks. You guys can share it with them or they can email me directly. And um, whatever they need, whatever you need to feel supported and so that you can carry on as a good, healthy lawyer, um, knowing that you're in control. So great. Thank you so much, Katie. I was so great to meet you. And I hope our listeners got as much value out of the B word slash natural talent <laughs> slash strengths um, as I did. So thank slash you so much for warrior. sharing. Yes. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, you guys. I hope it was helpful. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. And please don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify, or wherever you love to listen to podcasts. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.
We should have uh, sang a uh, Thanksgiving song. You know any Thanksgiving songs? Turkey for you, turkey for me.